Greetings, ladies and metalgents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called We've Never Stopped, written by Teleros. Demblem looked down at the short biped that hung from the tree above him. It looked nothing like any species he was used to, though quite besides the clothes that he was wearing, its obvious intelligence behind those big, saucer-like eyes that scanned the crowd was unmistakable. Maybe it was another refugee from the Great War, he thought. The United World's interstellar services had been on the back foot ever since the self-replicating machines had been discovered, and what had begun as a war 400 parsecs away was virtually on the doorsteps of the great space station that Demblem called home. Sighing, he heaved himself up and ambled over to the small creature, ignoring the protests from his back rear legs as he did so. His days as an explorer were long behind him, but thanks to the war, his pension from the Department of Welfare Services was barely enough to live on. Never mind, fix a lifetime of cumulative injuries. Still, there was a reason he retired here. There was usually something new, or at least interesting, going on, and he'd never lost the spark for adventure. The small creature swung around on its branch as he approached, holding itself upside down with its arms and legs. A biped, Damblin thought, though he couldn't see a tail, so it probably wasn't a good climber. Hello there, he said, looking up and smiling. Seen anything interesting? Hello, the biped said. There's so many aliens here. The biped's voice actually came from a small, black circular object strapped near the end of the pale, fleshy upper limb. Though Damblin could just make out the native tongue under the artificial voice of the what was obviously a translation unit. Curious, he hadn't seen one of that small before. The biped's words made Damblin wonder. Was it a child? There certainly are, Damblin agreed. My name is Damblin. Mine's Jerry. The biped stuck out a hand sadly. Then when Damblin didn't respond, he said, You're supposed to shake it. Ah, my apologies. Definitely a child, he decided. I haven't seen your species before. Uh, where are you from, if you don't mind me asking? It's Loha. Jerry said, it's the first time I've been this far from home without my mom and dad. Are they here? No, but I expect that they'll come to pick me up soon. If you do see them, don't tell them I'm here, though. Jerry said, suddenly very earnest. I, I really want to uh, explore this place. Demblin couldn't help but smile. All right, I promise. Say, why don't I show you around? Cool. Thanks, mister. Demblin lifted a scaly arm up to help Jerry down but the child surprised him by twisting upright and then dropping straight down onto the grass. Can we get one of those, please? Hmm. Demblin followed the direction of Jerry's outstretched arm, and his eyes settled on an advert at one of the fast food joints at the station. Well, he thought, it was certainly cheap enough, even with his budget. What if you can't eat it? I can eat anything, Jerry boasted. Come on! Despite the differences in size and mass, Demblin was three times the height of Jerry and a centroid to boot. The elder alien found himself being almost dragged along by the carefree, energetic youngster. It was mid-morning and the store was empty. Too late for those who'd come for breakfast, too early for the lunch crowd. So he was able to go straight up to the counter. He placed a hand on the touchscreen and saw his balance flash up. Not much, but enough. Hey... Does it do that if I touch it? Before Damblin could even think to stop him, Jerry shoved his hand onto the touchscreen. An error code for an unknown user appeared for a moment, and then Demblin swore a tiny light in Jerry's translation unit flashed. The error code disappeared, and a long, long string of digits appeared on the screen. Cool. Can I have one of those, please? Coming right up, the shop's AI announced. Demblin stared down at the child. Jerry seemed totally unconcerned as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. The numbers he'd just seen, he could have bought the station, the entire solar system, with that kind of money. Sure, real estate this close to the Great War wasn't as expensive as it used to be, but still, what in the galaxy was going on here? What kind of person had enough computing power to break the encryption even on a mere kilo cubit computer in under a second? Damblin had seen all manner of things as an explorer, 
and long experiences have given him a good idea of what the United World Security Services was capable of, and this, in his estimation, far surpassed anything he'd seen from them. This was not good. Emblem had never thought of himself as a moral paragon. Few who chose the life of an explorer were, but he knew right from wrong, and more to the point, he knew the station had more than enough people aboard who'd stop at nothing to wield that kind of power. Hell, the security services would probably be the first in line, which meant that he had no choice if he was going to live with himself. He'd have to keep Jerry safe and hope his parents arrived sooner rather than later. The food arrived shortly, a big piece of meat in the bread bun, and Jerry climbed up onto the table to eat, legs kicking idly back and forth as they dangled over the edge. Oh, is it? It's okay. Aunt Dolly makes better burgers, though. A meaningless reference, but the nonchalant innocent criticism had Demblem worried. If Jerry didn't realize the power he had strapped to his wrist and offered to show it to the wrong person, he could take him back to his apartment, but his security was no better than the computers used here. Jerry could escape almost any time he wanted to. Hmm. Demblem tried to mask his fears and hoped the young child couldn't read his facial expressions. What say I give you a tour of the station? I can show you the best bits. That'd be so cool. Michael's gonna be so jealous when he hears about this. Managed Jerry in between mouthfuls of what he called a burger. I only got here half an hour ago, so I've not seen it yet. I was just watching all the aliens. You come from a single species planet, but surely you recognize some of the different species here? Nope. I've never seen an alien before in my life, honest. Jerry added, sensing Damblin's skepticism. Their first stop was the Galleria, a wide corridor that looked out over the very colored gas giant that the station orbited. Along the way, Demblum continued his gentle probing, seeking to understand more of the strange creature that he was escorting around the station. He sent a discreet message to a drinking buddy of his who worked at customs, attaching a picture of Jerry to see if the staff there had seen any of Jerry's species in the last day or so, but knew that it would take a while before he got a response. Mr. Denlin, did you fight in the war? Uh-huh. I heard someone talking about a big war, Jerry said. Can you tell me about it? You, uh, don't know about the Great War. No, my grandpa was a soldier, I mean, a marine, and he fought in a war, but that was a long time ago, before I was born. Demblum stopped to look quizzically at this young charge. Questions. So many questions bubbled up in his mind. We've been fighting the Great War for sixty years now, he said at last. One day, a long way away, a huge spaceship nobody had never seen before arrived in a solar system. But there was nobody inside, just lots of very nasty machines. They killed all the people there, and built more machines, then went to other solar systems to try and do the same thing. Everyone sent in their warships to try and stop them, but the machines were very powerful, and there were so many of them that we couldn't stop them. So for 64 years, we've been steadily losing the war. Is that why you have a bad leg? Oh, that. <laughs> no, I've never fought in the war. I was an explorer, trying to find something in space that might help us. Emblem took Jerry's hand and guided the young biped down the Galleria towards the shrine. There are many strange and powerful things out there. Lost starships, abandoned space stations, maybe even relics from the progenitors themselves. What are they? Demblum paused and looked out at the giant window. Ah, good. Their view wasn't obstructed. He tapped the window and a holographic display panel appeared before him. With practiced ease, he manipulated the dials to focus in on a particular patch of space, zooming in until the distant far spiral galaxy could be clearly seen. Great bursts of light and gaping voids disfigured it, however, giving it a scarred appearance. The progenitors are our creators, he explained, many millions of years ago. In this distant galaxy, they made our ancestors. But then they went to war amongst themselves and cast us out of their galaxy. Their ruined stars, we call them. Well, what happened to the people who made you? We don't know, Demblin admitted, 
he returned the view from the window to normal and turned towards the entrance to the shrine. Many here worship them. Many others are just grateful they gave us a chance to live and escape their terrible war. To tear apart a galaxy like that, well, you can see why we'd want their help to face the machines. People say their ships have reached even here, though, and can be found, flittering amongst the stars. That much was true. Demblin was certain that he'd seen one himself, though it had been decades ago. A barely visible teardrop, skin shimmering with all the colors of the rainbow, but going fast, much too fast for him to ever have caught up with. Jerry nodded eagerly, his childish mind clearly glossing over the tragedy to focus on the exciting bits. Yeah, my grandpa used to tell Michael and I exciting stories about the war he was in. Once he and dad was going to let us try grandpa's weapons, but mom said that we were still too young, he pouted. That story's all new to you, isn't it? Demblin stated. Yep, my dad says God made just two of us a long time ago, and then we all came from them. Not many gods, continued Demblin as they stepped into the shrine. No, I mean, last year we were taught about all the Greek gods, and there were some really cool stories, but they would just pretend they weren't real. Wow, this is really cool. Jerry said all sorts of lessons gone as he took in the cream and ivory colors and rounded, almost organic architecture of the progenitor's shrine. An assortment of aliens sat, stood, or knelt together in a quiet contemplation in the main chamber, or alone in a little alcove that abutted the main chamber. In the background, the sound of light, rain, and running water could be heard, giving the place a soothing, relaxed atmosphere. The serenity of the shrine was shattered by a sound Demblem hadn't heard in years. The station-wide security alarm. Red warning lights emitted from hollow projectors swept the interior to the shrine and the galleria, and Demblem but off a curse as he realized that he had a child with him. Is something bad happening? I don't know, he lied. Those alarms didn't go off by accident. They were fully isolated from the rest of the station's computer network and required physical keys from two high-ranking officers to activate. Let's try and find out. The station's populace was panicking now, and despite his bad leg, Demblem hoisted Jerry onto his wide lower back rather than risk the child getting trampled underfoot. As a member of one of the larger species in the United Worlds, however, Demblem had little difficulty pushing his way through the crowds whilst his fingers tapped out a message to his contacts in the station staff on his compad. Machines! Yes, they hit the main hangar first, escape pods still work. Polar hangar still fine, thanks. Is it the machines? Demblem hesitated, but only for a moment. Yes, we're a dozen parsecs behind the front lines. They rarely attack so deep. He pushed his way into the elevator and... Leaning against the wall from the exertion, entered the floor number for the surviving hangar, the small one situated at the very top of the station, rather than the main one that was wrapped around the station like a great torus. The elevator refused to budge, and Demblem felt a rising panic as error code scrolled past on the touchscreen. It's too soon for them to have shut everything down, he muttered. Jerry clambered up his upper torso and leant over his shoulder to tap a polar hangar button, and a moment later, the error codes vanished as the elevator began to move. Maybe you didn't push the button properly, he said. Damblem didn't respond. Apparently immunized against the flood of malware and physical damage that always accompanied a machine assault, the elevator soon arrived at the polar hangar, and the door slid smoothly open. Damblem half stumbled out, pushing aside despite his stature and half a dozen other people who'd made it to the elevator with him. Where are we going now? We need a starship with a working warp drive, Demblem explained as he hobbled forwards. He's badly banged his right rear knee joint in the rush, and it was much worse than usual now. We- Jerry, where in the blazes have you been? Your mother's been worried sick. Jerry's father, the resemblance was undeniable, strode up to Demblem, anger writ large on his crossy's face. His skull lifted as he faced Demblem for the first time. Please accept my apologies. I do hope that he hasn't been any trouble. What's going on? He asked as he picked up Jerry easily and sat his son on his shoulders. He was a delightful companion, Demblem admitted, which caused Jerry to shove his hand forward and give him a big thumbs up. And it hadn't taken a genius to indicate what the child meant. But we must get to your ship. The machines are already on board. The sound of rending 
tearing metal burst up from the elevator shaft, and Damblum leapt away faster than he thought possible, scrambling around on all four legs as a thick metallic ooze boiled up and into the corridor. Sensing the presence of living organisms, the ooze twisted and moved with aggressive purpose, growing pseudopods that glowed pink with hydrogen plasma sheets and crackled with electrical power. Jerry and his father were swallowed up in an instant. At least, it would be quick, Demblum thought to himself, closing his eyes. And besides, maybe he deserved it. He'd failed as an explorer, failed even to protect Jerry from... Hey! Hey, Mr. Demblum! Come on! Which ship do you want to use? Demblum blinked his eyes open and stared uncomprehendingly. Jerry was shaking his arm, concern all over his youthful features, not a scratch on him. Even his clothes were untouched. Behind him, his father was standing amidst a puddle of metallic ooze, one hand open, palm up. Floating above it in midair was a small globule of the nanotechnological horrors that had attacked the station. It took Demblum a moment to realize that the rest of the ooze was still. In fact, everything. The alarms had stopped somehow, and all he could hear was the heavy breathing and a handful of terrified fellow station inhabitants. Hi! What? How? I've sent the shutdown code to the machines, Jerry's father said, tossing the ball of nanotechnology aside. It sank into the rest of the ooze with a metallic plop. He heaved Damlin upright and gave him a pat on the back. We, we've tried that before. They isolated the effector pulses and changed their code. We think through some kind of subspace signal. I know how they work. Jerry's dad shook his head and leaned back against the wall. Bloody hell, he sighed. Dad, what will mum say? The adult ignored his son's protests and ruffled his uh, hair affectionately. The name's Alexander, by the way. Alexander Chester. He proffered a hand and smiled when Herr Demblin shook it. What's been going on here? Demblin briefly recounted the events of the Great War and the long, seemingly hopeless fight against the self-replicating machines. But I don't understand, he said at last. How did you... Are they yours? Alexander nodded soberly. Yes, sir. Uh, although they're very old. I wonder how they even got out here. This place was meant to be a sanctuary. It all started to come together, and Demlin felt his knees go weak as he realized who, or rather what, he was talking to. Curiosity, as ever, drove him onwards. What happened? he asked. In the ruined stars. Uh, Jerry, why don't you go amuse yourself with the ships over there? Uh, don't break anything. Okay. Alexander waited until his son was out of earshot. The war to end all wars, sir. Uh, that's what my ancestors called it at the time. Damn near destroyed the Milky Way and ourselves. When the dust settled, there was nobody else left, just us and those we sent here. We wanted something to outlive us, and we calculated this galaxy was distant enough. Obviously, someone made a mistake, he said, gesturing to the quescent pools of mercury filling the corridor. It looked like it was beginning to thin out, or perhaps drain away into the rest of the station. I just wish that we could have made good right, but... Destruction has always been so much easier and so much more permanent than creation. Still, how does mining nanotech end up in a million parsecs from home? Demblum sank back down at the mention of mining nanotech. The thought that the United Worlds had spent so much blood and treasures fighting wayward mining robots was too terrifying to contemplate. It was all he could do to keep the contents of his stomach down. What now? he asked. Well, Jerry needs to get home in time for supper. But out here, uh, that's up to you. We'll try and leave you all in peace. Certain overly adventurous children permitting. That is, uh, but uh, we try not to interfere if we can help it. It never ends well. But think of the things that you could do, Demblum protested. I know, believe me, I know. But I'm a human, Mr. Demblum. Someone like me, a few million years ago, packed your ancestors into stasis pods and sent them all the way to this galaxy. Maybe we uplifted you, maybe we just found you, but we decided we knew best. So we took you and drove you from your home so that we could kill each other more efficiently. But... And Mr. Demblum, for all that our science has advanced by leaps and bounds since then, for all that we can work miracles our ancestors could never dream of, just remember this. Much as I hate to say it, you are better off not having anything more to do with us, because... Alexander fixed Demblum with his eyes, and the big centroid shuddered as he stared into the depths of... Uh, of... Uh, something. Something that scared him even more than the machine said. We've never stopped fighting.
and then the moment was over. Come on, Jerry, time for supper. I'm not hungry, I ate already. Well, you should have known better. Come on, say goodbye to Mr. Demblem. Jerry came running back over, and at the last moment leapt up to give Demblem a big hug. Your scales feel funny, he said as he rested his head against Demblem's torso. Can we come and visit again, Dad, please? We'll see, Alexander said, in a manner that Demblem knew without a shadow of doubt meant absolutely not. Say goodbye now. Bye-bye. Good, young Jerry, Demblem said, smiling again. He waved goodbye to the pair of humans. Behave yourself. I will, Jerry promised. And then they were gone. There was no sudden rush of air, no fancy light show. They just vanished. Well, Demblem thought to himself, he never thought anything would top entering the ruins of De Kesmo 4. But this, probably, it was too fantastic to ever be believed. Looking around the polar hangar, he stretched and frowned. Something was right. His leg no longer hurt. Demblem paused and reached back to massage his rear right knee joint. Sure enough, there was no pain, not even the aches that had been with him for years now. Shaking his head wonderingly, he stepped towards the thin puddle that was all that remained of his civilization's greatest foe. Paused, then defiantly splashed through it, harmless as promised. It was only when he got into the elevator that he realized something else was wrong. The elevator. How was it still in one piece, let alone perfect working order? Demblum stepped out into the galleria and stared out the windows. Far below, he could just make out the top of the main hangar ring, but that didn't make any sense either. The machines would have stripped it for raw materials when they boarded. Could, had the humans done this? There was one major difference, Demblum noted, as he made his way back to his apartment. The garden where he'd first met Jerry had been transformed, and a semicircular rows of vertical stone slabs filled much of the redesigned interior and surrounded by small red flowers of a species he did not recognize. Each one had a name engraved on it, along with the deceased's date of birth, and today's date. Two-thirds of the station's population was represented in that garden. Demblin realized with a start, and he felt his grief well up inside him as he recognized all too many names. In the center of the semicircle stood another new feature, a tall fountain, its water bubbling away, Demblem stood and watched, and gave a start when he noticed the engraving carved into the statue and written in standard. In memory of all those who died in the final battle against the machines, may they never be forgotten. Demblem eventually made his way back to his apartment, which looked much as he had left it when he'd set out this morning. The events of the day had been fatiguing, and he knew there'd be all manner of officials swarming over the station before too long throwing their weight around, demanding answers, and generally making a nuisance of themselves. He sat down heavily on his favorite stool, and frowned as he heard something drop onto the floor. He looked around, but couldn't see anything. Grumbling, he stood up and knelt down, peering under the stool. A tiny red light on Jerry's black wrist computer flashed at him. End of story. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Bushmaster177, Lord Azrakal, Ambrose Cattell, Quantum Wednesday, Trigzoon, WRE, and Blueberry Cat. Thank you very much for the support. It is super appreciated.